praise his name? The rocks will? Well, this song is, we want the rocks to be silent because we're going to praise his name. Rocks keep silent while we pray. Oh, let the mountains hide its voice as the saints of God rejoice. They have come to give Him glory for His great and mighty grace. Let the rocks keep silent while we pray. Let the rocks keep silent. of God rejoice, we have come to give him glory for his great and mighty ways. Let the rocks keep silent while we pray. Saints of God rejoice, we have come to give him glory for his great and mighty ways. Let the rocks keep silent while we pray. Let the rocks keep silent while we pray. Keep silent. Let the rocks keep silent while we pray. Keep silent while we pray. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. That uh, song, Let the Rocks Keep Silent While We Praise, that goes back to actually to Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem when the people were praising him and all, and the Pharisees said, yeah, everybody be quiet. And Jesus said, uh-uh, <laughs> if they're quiet, then the rocks are going to cry out. Yeah, so we're here today to worship and praise the Lord. It's good to see you. Hope everybody's had a good week, uh, especially good, good to see all our guests today. We welcome you, and uh, we hope you'll feel welcome and we'll want to come back again. It's good to be together, and we just... Uh, we're glad to have you with us today. If you are a first-time guest, we have, have a gift for you, and that you can get that gift as you leave today out in the uh, vestibule. There, folks have a gift for you. And we, again, we're glad to see you, each and every one of you today. Uh, Pastor Joy is uh, still away this week, and uh, uh, Pastor uh, Jason's going to be bringing the message today. We look forward to that. So we're here to worship the Lord together, and, and again, it's good to be together. Okay, let's all stand up. We're going to do some praise songs. The first one. It's an oldie. It's embedded. It's called the Happy Method. And it's fast. So if your tongue gets all twisted up, it just keep going. It'll catch up. All right, go ahead, Bob. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Not I am with thee, peace be still, in all life let's ebb and flow. Feasting 
resting on the riches of his grace, resting beneath his sheltering wings, always looking on his smiling face. That is why I shout and sing. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er oh my soul, like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I could sing unending songs of how you saved my soul. And I could run a thousand miles because of your great love. I could sing a thousand miles of thousand I could run a thousand miles because of your great love. We'll rejoice for he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Woo! was on death row, guilty in the first degree, son of God hanging on a hill, hell was my destiny, crowds were shouting crucified, could have come from these lips of mine. Dirty shame was killing me. It would take a miracle to wash me clean. Then I read the red letters and the ground. The Holy Ghost awakened me. Yeah, the Holy Ghost awakened me. When I read the red letters and the ground began to shake, the prison walls started falling. I became a
of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You may be seated. Our special music this morning is Mr. Jimmy Jones. <coughs> The song I've uh, chosen to share with you this morning. The children are dismissed? Okay, children. Okay, all right. All right. Good to see the children. Good to see the children going. All right, good to see you. plan this, but great minds think alike. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying. Thank you, brother. God bless you. I will say this too. Uh, my name is uh, Jason uh, here, and uh, it is a privilege and honor to be with you uh, this morning and to speak and to bring God's word uh, always and uh, to fill in for Pastor Joey while he's away. 
And uh, what a great privilege it is to follow Brother Jimmy uh, last week. And thank you for bringing the word last week to us. I'm going to grab this that fell out real quick. Bringing the word last week as we are doing our prayer emphasis, praying first three times uh, a day. And if you're like me, uh, I've set my watch to go off, my, my, my watch dings, my phone rings. If my iPad's there, it's going off. Uh, just to remind me three times a day to be praying, to be praying, God, I want to know you. And last week, Brother Jimmy really set it up to help us know more about God. And he took us to seminary last week on uh, the attributes of God and not just any of the attributes, but those that God wants us to participate with him and grow to be more like him. So thank you so much, Brother Jimmy, for that encouraging word. And for God to unify our people to do your mission. And one of the things we've been saying around here lately is that we're two churches with one mission, that we're better together, that God has called us to reach the nations and reach people with the gospel. And that is a unifying thing together. And we're praying for that. And we're praying thirdly, that God would help us to show his love today. And I I hope you've been encouraged. If you've been participating in that, been able to pray those things multiple times a day, that God will hear and answer those prayers as, as two churches, we're praying those things together to see those things happen. This morning, we're going to look, I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter one, Philippians chapter one. If you have a Bible, there's one in the pew in front of you, Um, Philippians chapter one. And as last week, we jumped into God, I want to know you. This week, we're going to look at the second prayer that we've been praying. God, unify your people to do your mission. And, and I don't know about you, as, as we look around the world, there's, there's not a lot of unity in the world. There's a lot of discourse, discord, there's a lot of strife. If, if there's anything right now, if you say the sky is blue, someone's going to turn right around and say it's brown or black or purple or yellow or something. If you say it's Carolina blue, you're gonna, someone's going to say, no, it's Duke blue. I mean, I mean they're going to argue to you to they're blue in the face. Uh, we, we are so, we're very, very divided. It's a very divided time. Uh, and this past year has been, but God has called us to be together and called the church to be united. And Paul wrote this particular letter in very difficult circumstances. He was actually, he was in prison. He desired to go to the church in the city of Philippi. He desired to go with them, to encourage them, to build them up. He wasn't sure, he really didn't think he was going to live to to do that in person. And so he wrote this letter to them. The citizens of this city, the people in the city during this time, they actually had like an elevated status because of um, the formation of the Roman Empire. When the Roman Empire was being formed and expanded, the, the people of Philippi actually were granted citizenship as a reward for sort of being loyal and faithful to Rome. And uh, that brought with it some big benefits, like uh, a tax-free holiday. How many of you like that? Hello? Yeah. So these guys, they were pretty pretty excited. They were pretty proud of their status, being a tax-free city under the Roman Empire, uh, which was unusual. And uh, it was also the place, like, if you served in the Roman army, um, if, uh, if, if you put in your time and did your 20 years... Uh, if, and you lived, you know, and you survived, you're 20, uh, in the Roman uh, army, they would, uh, you, you could retire to Philippi. So Philippi was filled with a, with a lot of retired um, uh, military officers and um, who got to live the rest of their days tax-free, and I'm sure they got together at the VFW, wherever they got together, they had their fish fries or their Brunswick stews or whatever, and, and told old war stories and all of those things. The church that Paul's writing to was a pretty diverse crowd. The people in Philippi uh, in this church, they they were different. There were people, you had people who were very educated, who were very wealthy. And you also had people who were former and freed slaves. You had people who had a lot of education and wealth and social status. And those who, who were living in the new freedom that they found in Christ. And these people were, were all worshiping and serving together. And yet, Paul has a word and an encouragement for them. And I believe he has a word and an encouragement for us today, for the church today, in the time that we live. It's, it's not easy. 
it's, it, it can be difficult. It can be very divisive, but he can unify us. So, so the question I want to ask this morning is, is how can we be unified to fulfill God's mission? How can we be unified to fulfill God's mission? And so let's read this together, and then we'll look to God's word, because I think he answers that question this morning. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, and this morning we're going to read verses 27 through 30. He says, Paul writes, he says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm, in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now here that I still have. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for this church that you have built. And Lord, we thank you for your word that you have given us. And Lord, as we read and study and meditate on your word this morning, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us, encourage us, edify us, convict us, draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said together, amen. How can we be unified to fulfill God's mission? I think the first thing that Paul tells us is that we can be unified to fulfill God's mission by standing firm in the Spirit. By standing firm in the Spirit. Now, Paul used a military term here, by standing firm. That was the only way to win the battle. That was the only way to fight the battle, was to stand firm in the face of opposition, in the face of the oncoming opponents. It was a military term for holding the line. As you can, if, you know, if, if, if you have studied ancient military tactics or watched Gladiator, <laughs> that was my generation, Gladiator, and uh, Russell Crowe, I mean, that's, that's just, I mean, embedded in my mind, is uh, linked, the, the armies linked arm and arm standing against the enemy. And that's the, that's the picture that he's, he's giving us, standing firm. This past week, we... Uh, we snuck the girls and furniture dog off to the coast because, you know, Baptist, you can go to the beach, but, you know, the coast, you know, it's a little, you know, we kind of say it's the coast. We're going to the coast. Went to the coast, sitting down under the little shade out there. We're watching the waves roll in. And um, Paw Paw comes staggering off of the path onto the beach. Not our Paw Paw, but just we're going to call him Paw Paw. And He's unsteady in the sand, but he is headed to the water. His goal, and he's, t he's got his shirt off, he's got his bathing shorts on, and I mean, and he's like, he's, I mean, he's going straight in. It's like he's 12, man. I mean, it's like, this is a kid going to the ocean, and it's like, he's going for a swim. He gets there, boom, waves are crashing. He staggers back. Another, and it, but he keeps going. Second wave hits. Boom. Paw Paw goes down. Paw, Paw go, Paw Paw's down. And Amy looks over at me like, um, should we be concerned about Paw Paw? And, and I told her, I said, look, I'm watching them. I'm eagle eyed. I got, you know, I got my transition lenses on. They're, you know, they're shaded up right now. But I'm, I'm watching Paw Paw. If he goes down hard, I'm going to full on David Hasselhoff <laughs> straight out there. You know, ch -ch 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 I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drag him out. I already, I already had it in my mind. Just don't worry. It's that, just, it's that instinct, you know, that you have. And um, Pawpaw's mouth is like barely above the water. You know, it's barely, it's like, if he goes down, I'm, I'm getting up. I'm getting up now. He gets up. He gets one, one more good wave. Psh, he jumps in. He must have seen Mammal coming down the beach from picking up her seashells because just, just as determined as he was, to take his morning swim, boom, he's bolting out of the water. I think he didn't want to get caught. I think he knew he wasn't supposed to go swimming, but he saw Mamaw coming, and he was like, oh, yeah, I'm, I was just taking a walk too, you know, just totally covered. Uh, and he, he, makes it, he makes it back. I didn't have to, you know, 
show my kids my, you know, David Hasselhoff skills or anything. Um, but uh, it, was, it was a picture that we saw when you're down at the coast. It's a vivid reminder, if you've ever walked on the sand, how hard it is to keep your footing. How hard it is is the sand. You can be st- firmly planted, but that sand starts shifting under your feet. And the waves come, then the opposition comes. And it's hitting you. And just as you, get, just as you get up from one wave, guess what? There's another wave coming. And when you're by yourself, it's almost impossible to stand. And that, it spoke to me. It spoke to me because it reminded me of why Paul encourages us to stand together in one spirit. To stand together. That's the only way that we can stand firm. And he he says that firmness is not just, not just because we're, we might be like-minded. Um, it's not just because we, you know, we kind of like to hang out in the same places or eat the same food or have the same, same passions or hobbies. But, but as the church, we can stand firm with one spirit. And that spirit is not just, just the spirit of encouragement or, or what, but it's the Holy Spirit. God's spirit. The part of God that is Jesus was teaching his disciples and they were going around and they were walking and talking with Jesus and uh, got to see him do some miracles and teaching and all, and all of these things. And he gets close to the, to the end and, and there, it's like you read, the, you read the gospels and the disciples are still trying to figure it out. You know, it's like they still don't quite know and, and Jesus is starting to tell them, hey, he's going to, He's going to have to suffer, and, and he's going to go away. And they're like, what do you mean you're going to go away? You know, they, they were really expecting Jesus to usher in the eternal kingdom, and it, that's going to happen. But they were expecting it then, right then, to, for it to happen. And Jesus says, no, if, if I go away, I'm going to send the comforter. He's going to come. And these same guys that, you know, you read about in the Gospels who were you know, fighting among themselves over who was going to be, you know, greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And these guys who were, you know, um, like Peter who denied Christ, who was so strong, but then like had this moment where he just, you know, he, he was just afraid. These same guys, when you flip over to the book of Acts, they're preaching in view of being killed and crucified in stone, just like Jesus was. And thousands are coming to faith. Why? Because the Holy Spirit came upon them and empowered them and filled them. Romans 8.11 says, and Paul writes this, he says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, if the spirit of him, the spirit of Christ, if the Holy Spirit, if God himself is dwelling in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. How much power is that? Power over life and death and hell and the grave. I know of no greater power. Do you? There is no in this in this body pack right here, right here, in this pack, there are two fresh Kirkland batteries. You know where that came from? Costco. There's probably a gallon tub back there somewhere, double A batteries that run these things. And I think we go through a bunch here. There's is, there is no greater power than the power of God. And if you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. There's no greater power you need. But so many times we disconnect ourselves from Him. There's so many things that in this life that I like to be consistent and my wife has trained me well. She's got me on a, a 12-step program. Uh, and I didn't realize this when we were dating at the time. But right after I said I do, then there was a 12-step program that I started on. And I'm on about step three or four. And one of those, and one day, if before, maybe before Jesus comes, I'll, I'll get to like 12. Like that. I'm, I'm, guys, I'm praying for that. Um, we... I like consistency. She's got me trained on consistency. She's got me trained on meals. Thursday night is Chick-fil-A night. And when they opened one on Gate City Boulevard, I was like, this is like heaven has come home and glory has filled my soul. Uh, and, and Gate City Boulevard is like chicken heaven. 
Because you can, you can have uh, Chick-fil-A, Popeye's, uh, Zaxby's, or the tried and true KFC. You can, and on your way to those, you can pull through, through a cookout, get your milkshake and a dozen donuts from Krispy Kreme. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm just throwing that out there. I, I like consistency. I and mean, we, have, we have a schedule in our house. We have like spaghetti night, pizza night, Chick-fil-A night, and all of those things. This whole last year blew our consistency and my consistent schedule out of the water. I mean, we had, we had these edicts that said you, you had to shut down. Like you could not meet or gather. We had to close the store. for the, You know, we're used to closing the store for like a hurricane or like the power goes out or something. We have to close for like a day, not six weeks on end. And that's never happened. And it wasn't like I could call my dad or call my grandpa and say, hey, you know, the last time you guys went through this, what, what did y'all do? No, no one could do that. Uh, uh, all, all the churches, there, you couldn't call Lifeway and say, hey, the last time we did a pandemic, what did we do? They, they, they couldn't give you, everyone was having to make decisions on the fly and do different things, try different things. At Restoration, we moved about three different times. We kept getting like booted out of where we were. We were online. We did some outdoor things. You know, we, we've all had to change a lot of things. But there's only one thing we should never change. There's only one thing that we should always stand firm in, and that's through the Holy Spirit and the power of God. Everything else is going to change. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to change. But he never changes. Every, everyone and everything else in this life is going to let us down. But the Lord will never let us down. So we can have confidence and we can stand firm in the one who created us, the one who died for us, the one who lives for us, the one who's coming back for us. That's where we can build our life. The Spirit is the presence of, your, of God that we receive at the moment of salvation. He is our counselor, our comforter, he guides us, convicts us, empowers us, and sanctifies us. So let me ask a question as we, as we look at this, standing firm in the Spirit. How, let me ask you this question. How are you standing firm in the Spirit in your life right now? How are you cultivating and growing your relationship with God? Because you know, that's really that's the most important question you can answer in your life. Have you received... Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and are you growing in Him? Are you becoming more like Him? That is, that is one reason why, why we do groups. We, have Sunday, we do Sunday school, we do groups. That's the reason these things came about. You, you can't connect and grow closer uh, just coming in, singing a, singing a couple songs, listening to, to, to some good music, and a guy get up and speak for 20, 25, 45 minutes, an hour, however long he goes, because he... He doesn't have, his watch isn't connected up to his phone because he left it on the kitchen counter this morning. He, he doesn't know what time it is. He, you don't know how long he's, oh, Amy's pointing to the, there's a big clock right here on the front. If you don't know, it's facing the preacher. And I, I've got five more minutes, so uh, we're on first, the first point. We can, we can be unified together by standing firm in the Spirit. But Paul doesn't leave us there just by standing firm. He gives us point number two. We can be unified together to, to do God's mission by striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. By striving side by side. If you look, he says in here, in verse 27, uh, about halfway through, he says, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. That was Paul's desire for the for the Philippians, not only that they would stand firm, but that, that standing firm, that being connected to the Spirit, being connected to God, growing in their relationship with Him, would lead them on into the charge of taking the gospel to those around Him. 
Whenever, that was the whole reason Paul went to Philippi in the first place, was to take the gospel so the people would hear the good news. And he went, and people got saved, and, and some amazing things happened there. And a church was born. And it wasn't just so like they could hang out and be cool and, and, you know, and kind of do some activities together, but so that others would hear the life-changing message that comes through faith in Christ. This term for striving that Paul used was an athletic term. It was used for athletes who trained in order to compete in the athletic event, the games of the times. Um, and they, they were big in the ancient world. Um, and, and, and right now we're coming up upon the Olympics is happening. I mean, we're excited. Um, delayed a year. You know, they're on lockdown over there. We don't, we don't know who's going to get to compete and what what games are going to happen, what it's going to look like. Um, I did see, I, I don't know if you saw it, we did, we just finished the Olympic trials where our athletes who've been training for years to go to the Olympics, they compete and the, the top are selected to represent Team USA uh, in, in the Olympics. And I don't know if you saw it, but Simone Biles is our, like, Gymnast. I mean, she's our top one. And she performed this routine at the Olympic trials and ran across that mat and did about 100 flips in the air. Like, I did not know the human body could flip and do that many, like, turns and gyrations and, one, and lands on her feet. I mean, it's like, this woman is amazing. She has... And she didn't just watch a couple YouTube videos and said, I think, I'm, I think I'll try this, like, gymnast thing. She didn't just say, you know, I think I could, hey, y'all, watch this. I think I could do that. She trained, and she's striving. And I'm sure, I'm sure when the cameras were off, there were times and times and times where she got up and, and failed. She didn't make it. She failed. She said, no, I can do this. And she strove. And she trained. She didn't just sit at home and say, you know what, uh, the Olympics are next year. I think, I'll, yeah, I think I'll show up and just, you know, whatever happens, happens. She strived for the gospel. You see, the, the church, we were not designed to just sit and soak. We, we weren't designed to just, you know, come and hang out. We, we were designed to gather to encourage one another, to be built up in our faith in order to go and to take the gospel. And one way we can be unified is being unified on the mission is remembering that we gather for the mission. (laughs) And the mission is to see people know and accept Christ. That's our mission. If anything else becomes our mission, then we've gotten off mission. (laughs) And we're we're not doing what God has called us to do. And the, the church... Over and over throughout, if you study church history, over and over throughout church history, over and over we have to be reminded because we forget. We get, kinda, we get comfortable in our spot. We get comfortable in our, in our seats. Uh, there, there was one time I was, uh, first Sunday at the church I was pastoring in South Carolina. It was my first day. I had my suit, my tie on and everything, and I was nervous and People are coming in, and when it's your first week, like, you know, like, you know, you know the people who are on your search committee, and you know some of the deacons, the key leaders, but, like, everybody looks like a visitor. Like, you don't know who is a visitor and who's not, and uh, you know everybody's names. And I'm greeting people and shaking hands, and this, this couple comes down, and, and I greet them, and uh, they're obviously a visitor, um, but I'm treating everybody like a visitor. I'm, I'm meeting everybody first day, you know, and... Uh, they, uh, they, look, they get about, about the third pew here. Not to pick on the third pew, but they, they get to about the third pew. And they look at me and say, they say, is, uh, uh, is it okay if we sit here? So they're, they're obviously, they visited other churches before where there's assigned seating, you know. And as, as a good pastor, a good pastor knows if you're there or not, they can look, they can take one scan and know if you're at church or not, because you always sit in the same place. That's your spot. And if, if you move, it just, you, their tummy gets upset, and they, they get kind of like sweaty, because what are you sitting over there for? And 
this couple asked me, they said, can we, can we sit there? And I said, oh, no, ma'am, we don't, have a, we don't have names on the pews. You come just sit right here. And as, as they were ushering down the, the, into the pew, I looked, and there was a big placard right on the front that had somebody's name on it. And I said, oh, well, sorry, sorry Lord, forgive me for, for lying on that. There are names, but you can sit there. I, I'm, I'm sure they're, they're in glory now. They don't, they don't mind uh, that, you, that you sit there. But we, we can't forget what we're here for. And we gather for the mission. So let me, let me ask you uh, to strive side by side. Let me just ask you, how are you working to show and share the love of Christ? And that, that's part of our prayer that we've been praying through this month. Is Lord, help me show your love today. And uh, you, you start asking that prayer, God will bring people into your path and test you on that. Test you on that. Uh, it may be difficult. It may be someone in your own house that you have to show the love of Christ to. Amen? How are you working to show and share the love of Christ? And many times we use the application. We've, we've often been, been told to, to show the love of Christ, to strive together for the gospel. We can all pray. We can all pray. And who are you praying for that they would come to know Christ? Someone in your family or some, a co-worker, a friend, a neighbor, the nations. We can all give for the gospel and to take the gospel. And that's one of the hallmarks of, of our giving. Our giving isn't so we can build monuments to ourselves and all of those things. Our giving as the church is send those who can go and go for us and take the gospel to the hard places. And it's God calling you to go, to go share the gospel. And wherever that may be, he calls some to vocational ministry. He calls some to the mission field. He calls some to the marketplace. Where has God called you to go and to take the gospel? But finally, Paul tells us we can be unified together to do his mission. I think this is so important. By trusting by faith over fear. Trusting by faith over fear. Paul is writing this. Remember, he's He's been persecuted. He's in prison. He doesn't, he really doesn't think he's going to survive this imprisonment. And he knows that the church in, in Philippians is going to face some persecution. If they hadn't already, they're going to face some. So at church, all throughout church history, either we're going to face some persecution. It might even get worse, you know. Uh, in America, we have extensive freedoms. We have more freedoms than any other country in the world. Um, that could change tomorrow. We don't know. Uh, we enjoy them now. Um, we're not guaranteed them forever. And there are definitely places, many places in our world right now, uh, where it will cost you your job, uh, your very life, to profess faith in Christ, uh, to, be, to be baptized publicly is a, is a big thing. Um, in, in some countries. Uh, we don't have to live in fear, though. And that's the important thing that Paul encourages us. You know, there's a healthy amount of fear. There is a, I mean, God does, gave us a little bit of fear um, because, you know, there is a fear of heights, so you don't, you know, jump off a tall building trying to be Superman and realizing you can't fly. You know, that's a, that's a healthy fear. There's a healthy fear of uh, snakes in my household. Healthy fear. A good snake is a dead snake. A good spider is a dead spider. That's right. Uh, fears of bees. Um, I, I, I stepped on one of those wasp nests, not, not like the one in the ground when I was about seven years old, playing in the backyard, in the woods, climbing trees and doing all the like kid stuff. We were fighting the British or whatever we were doing that day with sticks and all of that stuff. And, uh, man, I stepped on one of those. I thought I was afraid of bees. They swarmed over me, and one got stuck right in my ear. So, so he's stinging me. And, I mean, I, it did not help me to know that that, bee was more, that wasp was more scared of me than I was of it. I mean, that did not help me in the moment. I just knew I heard this intense buzzing sound, the loudest buzzing sound. To this day... I'll get hives if I hear a buzz. You'll see me duck and cover, run it like it's a grenade or something. I mean, I will, I will probably lose a little bit. I keep two cans of the large spectricide 
at all times, I want to be 50 feet away from anything that buzzes or anything. I mean, they, my wife will tell me, she married me anyway, she knew, you know, I have, I have a healthy amount of fear and clowns. That's a healthy fear to be afraid of clowns. But there's also an unhealthy fear. Our world lives off of fear. Fear, the fear of the unknown. You don't know. The fear of the future, what's going to happen. And I hear the, 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 the latest one is, is uh, the fear of missing out. I don't want to miss out. I feel like I'm missing out on things. Everyone else is doing this or buying this or driving this, and I don't want to miss out. I just don't want to miss out on things. The enemy uses this fear to paralyze the church. It makes us afraid to speak up or to speak out, to speak the truth in love. Because you know, I don't. I mean, I don't want my friends to think I'm a weirdo or, you know, religious fanatic or whatever. What's the most friendly thing you can do? What's the most, the best friend thing you can do? Is to tell them the truth, that there is a God, that He did die for you, and you can be saved. And they, if they think you're weird, they think you're they think you're weird anyway. They wouldn't be your friend, you know. Um, 2 Timothy 1 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self control. The world wants to control us by fear. But God says, Take heart. With me, I've overcome the world. There is nothing in this life you have to fear. Even if, as Paul writes, hey, you're going to. He, he writes in there, he says, you're, you're going to face some of the same trials I am. You're get, there's going to be, there's suffering in the Christian life. It's real. It's real suffering. It's not imaginary. But because of him, we can overcome it. Suffering for the Christian is temporary because we know he is one in the battle. In fact, I believe Christianity thrives the most, the more we suffer, face persecution. Not the less. We show the testimony that we, we can rise above because of him who is in us. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. So as we come to a conclusion, I believe we can be unified together to do God's mission to be remembered that he has called us to take, he has, he has called us out and called us out to take his gospel around the world. And I want to ask the question as we close this morning, what fear is keeping you from following God? What is that fear? Is it the fear of people? <laughs> is it the fear of failure? I'll, I'll tell you honestly, I've, I've, I've experienced both of those fears. I've been afraid of people before. What they, what they might think, what they might say. I've been afraid. One of my greatest fears is the fear of failure. I don't, I don't want to let anyone down. That's my fear. And, um, but God is bigger. And God is greater. And this morning we can surrender our lives to him. We can build our lives on him. We can build our church on him. Because he loves us and cares for us. Would you stand together as we close and I'll invite uh, the musicians to come and get ready as we have a, have a time of invitation and a time where we can respond back to God's word. And you might, you might be here uh, and you might say, um, you know, Pastor Jason, um, I, I, don't know, I don't know Christ. I've never accepted him. I've never placed my faith and trust in him. This morning, you can respond to him, and we can pray with you and show you how you can accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You might, you might say, I don't know how <laughs> to be on mission with God. And I'd, I'd encourage you, connect with the Spirit, follow him, listen to him, 
is what he's calling you to do. He'll prompt you and uh, follow him and his will for your life. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word this morning. We thank you that you've not left us alone and we can trust you with our lives, everything we are. And this morning, in this time of invitation, Lord, we just want to just pause and reflect. And God, we, we ask you to show us your will for our lives, that we would follow you, whatever step, next step we need to take to follow you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.